It's time for the three question one for Biochem 12. Let's get going. What is the typical presentation of a patient with pancreatic insufficiency? So you might see diarrhea, steatorrhea, a malabsorption and weight loss, and deficiency of the fat soluble vitamins. So A, D, E, and K. Next, what are the symptoms of serotonin syndrome? So you're gonna see muscle rigidity, hyperthermia, and cardiovascular collapse due to autonomic instability. Next, what artery prevents a horseshoe kidney from ascending uh, in the abdomen? So this is your inferior mesenteric artery. All right, that's it for the warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. In this lecture, we're going to talk about energy metabolism and fuel use, particularly when you don't have enough energy substrates around. But before we get started, I wanted to introduce my nine-year-old son, Andrew. Is this where you make your videos, Dad? That's right. This is where the magic happens. We got the cameras and the lights. Cool. Hey, Dad. Do you think there's any way I could get an autograph? Well, sure, I guess, but it's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, I live with you. Why do you want my autograph? No, I don't want your autograph, Dad. I want Dr. Lewis's autograph. <sighs> get out of here. Let's start out talking about how your body transitions from the fed state to the fasting state to a state of starvation. So what happens when you haven't eaten in several hours and your body doesn't have enough glucose remaining from the last meal? Man, the liver is the primary regulator of serum glucose levels. So when you fast and the blood glucose starts to drop, the liver is going to start making new glucose through gluconeogenesis, and it's going to start mobilizing its glycogen stores, which we call glycogenolysis. And then as you get farther and farther from your last meal and your glycogen stores become depleted, you're going to start making ketone bodies, which is a process known as ketogenesis. So let's go through some questions in the study guide. Look at number four. It says, what fuels are produced and used in the post-absorptive period? So at this point, there are really just two fuels being produced. There's glucose from hepatic glycogenolysis and from gluconeogenesis, and there's fatty acids from adipose tissue. So fatty acids are stored in adipose tissue, and they represent another form of energy storage in your body beyond what's stored in the liver. And in the fed state, your adipocytes are happy. And they're storing lots of energy. Then when you get to an energy deficient state, those adipocytes have to give up that energy again. So again, what's produced in the post-absorptive period? Glucose from hepatic glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis, and then also fatty acids from adipose tissue. Then the fuel that's used is predominantly glucose. That's the go-to fuel for muscles and brain and other tissues. Your liver is able to generate a lot of glucose, so even though there may be some fatty acids being made, it's predominantly glucose that's being used. Then number five says, when does gluconeogenesis begin in the post-absorptive period, and when does it become fully active? So it begins four to six hours after the last meal. That's what's meant by the post-absorptive period, four to six hours after the last meal. And then gluconeogenesis becomes fully active when the glycogen stores are depleted, which is 10 to 18 hours after the last meal. So it takes at least 10 hours in a well-fed person with a healthy liver uh, to deplete the glycogen stores. So if you're trying to enter to ketosis, it's going to take a while. Now number six says, how does the pattern of fuel production and utilization change in early starvation? So we're beyond just an overnight fast now. We're not just in between meals. We're talking 24 hours after the last meal. So what's produced is glucose again, mainly from gluconeogenesis. There's not really much glycogenolysis going on anymore because you've used up most of your glycogen between 10 and 18 hours. So it's primarily glucose from gluconeogenesis. And then again, there's some fatty acids being produced from adipose tissue. And then what fuels your body uses depends on the tissue in question. So the brain uses predominantly glucose. The brain is very specialized. It really prefers glucose more than anything else, although it can use ketone bodies, but it really does need some glucose. But then muscles and other tissues use glucose sometimes, but they predominantly use fatty acids. So the rest of the body is going to use a secondary energy source like fatty acids much more readily than the brain will. The brain, again, primarily needs glucose, but muscles and other tissues can use fatty acids when needed. Then number seven says in intermediate starvation, so this is 48 hours after the last meal, how does the pattern of fuel production and utilization change? So now we're two days since the last meal. Uh, for fuel production, you still have glucose from gluconeogenesis. Your liver can still maintain that. You still have fatty acids from adipose tissue. Uh, now you're calling on those fatty acid reserves a lot more. So in intermediate starvation, your adipocytes are becoming much more important. And then you also have ketone bodies from the liver. And then what fuels are used? So again, the brain uses predominantly glucose, but also some ketone bodies. And then the muscles and other tissues use predominantly fatty acids, but also ketone bodies. Now, we're dealing with three main energy substrates. We talked about glucose, fatty acids, and now ketone bodies. And again, that process of generating ketone bodies is called ketogenesis. So in the liver, 
fatty acids and amino acids are metabolized into acetoacetate, which is a ketone body. And then you can use NADH to turn acetoacetate into another ketone body called beta-hydroxybutyrate. So you need to be able to recognize those two substances as the main ketone bodies, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And then lots of different tissues in your body, like muscle and brain, can use those ketone bodies for energy when there's not enough glucose around. You should also know that the rate-limiting enzyme for ketone body synthesis is HMG-CoA synthase, not HMG-CoA reductase. That's the enzyme that's inhibited by statins. We're talking about HMG-CoA synthase here. And not only can acetoacetate be converted into beta-hydroxybutyrate using NADH, but acetoacetate can also spontaneously become acetone. So as acetoacetate becomes acetone, patients that are making ketone bodies are going to start to have a slightly fruity smell to their breath from all this acetone. So that's one of the things you might notice in a patient that's in diabetic ketoacidosis, that fruity smell. Then another important point to know is that when you test for ketones in the urine of a DKA patient, you're actually only testing for acetoacetate. The urine test for ketones does not test for beta-hydroxybutyrate. So when would you start generating ketone bodies? Well, it's basically whenever you break down so many fatty acids and make so much acetyl-CoA that the TCA cycle can't handle it all. So you're going to start making ketone bodies. Now, think about people who go on an extreme, no-carb diet, like the Atkins diet. They want to start burning fat. They want to start breaking down fatty acids. They're trying to become ketogenic. So whenever there's prolonged starvation or a very, very low-carb diet, you're going to use up all your acetyl or oxaloacetate uh, because of gluconeogenesis. So using up all your oxaloacetate, you're depleting oxaloacetate. And as you deplete oxaloacetate, the TCA cycle has to slow down. So you're redirecting TCA cycle metabolites toward gluconeogenesis. So in times of excess gluconeogenesis, you're going to actually shut down the TCA cycle. When you shut down the TCA cycle, you're going to start making ketone bodies. So that brings us to number eight in the study guide. What metabolic scenario favors the synthesis of ketone bodies? It's when the production of acetyl-CoA from beta-oxidation of fatty acids exceeds the oxidative capacity of the TCA cycle. And then number nine says, true or false, ketone bodies can be used by all body tissues, including the brain. This is false. The brain can use ketone bodies, but red blood cells can only use glucose. So although the neurons of the brain prefer glucose, they can use ketone bodies, but red cells can only use glucose. Then, going back to our stepwise discussion of starvation, number 10 says, what is the pattern of fuel production and utilization in prolonged starvation? So not between meals, not overnight, not 48 hours. Now we're talking five days after the last meal. So what's being produced? Well, really, it's the same three things. You're still making glucose from hepatic gluconeogenesis. Uh, you're using fatty acids. Uh, you're making fatty acids from adipose tissue, and then also ketone bodies. But what's different here is the pattern of fuel use. So at five days, the brain is predominantly using ketone bodies at this point. So the brain is finally given in. It's not using glucose anymore. It's primarily using ketone bodies. And then the muscle and other tissues are predominantly using fatty acids, but also some ketone bodies, and some of these tissues are going to need some glucose, like the red blood cells. So predominantly fatty acids, but also ketone bodies and a little bit of glucose. And then number 11 says, comparing an overnight fast to a three-day fast, what percentage of energy comes from glucose and from ketone bodies? So after an overnight fast, 90% comes from glucose, primarily from mobilizing glycogen stores and only about 5% comes from ketone bodies. The other 5% or so comes from fatty acids. And then after a three-day fast, 60% comes from ketone bodies, and only 40% comes from glucose, primarily from gluconeogenesis, again, because you've already burned through your glycogen stores. Let's also talk a little bit about ethanol, because ethanol also can be used as an energy substrate. So we looked at this pathway for the metabolism of ethanol back in the farm video on drug metabolism. We talked about the two enzymes that break down ethanol. You have alcohol dehydrogenase that converts ethanol to acetaldehyde, and then acetaldehyde dehydrogenase converts acetaldehyde to acetate. And then acetate can ultimately be used to make acetyl-CoA. We're going to come back and talk about why acetyl-CoA is such an important molecule in just a second. But the thing I want you to focus on here is the fact that both of these reactions generate NADH. So picture this, if you will. You knock back a couple of drinks on an empty stomach. Since you're in that post-absorptive period, at least six hours after your last meal, your liver is supposed to be putting up a steady supply of glucose back into the circulation through gluconeogenesis, right? Well, when ethanol is around, the hepatocyte is going to preferentially metabolize the ethanol in order to clear it out of the system. So if the liver has to choose between gluconeogenesis and metabolizing ethanol, it's going to actually metabolize the ethanol first. So while the hepatocytes are busy metabolizing ethanol, they're making a lot of NADH. 
And in order to keep metabolizing ethanol, they've got to convert that NADH back to NAD. And the, the way they do that, the way the liver does that, is by re, uh, converting pyruvate to lactate and also by converting oxaloacetate to malate. So if there's no pyruvate and no oxaloacetate available, because it's all been converted to lactate and to malate to regenerate NAD, how on earth is gluconeogenesis supposed to take place? Well, it doesn't. So the bottom line is when your liver is metabolizing ethanol, it can't perform gluconeogenesis. And that can cause a severe fasting hypoglycemia in patients that consume a lot of alcohol in a fasting state. Now, I mentioned in passing that acetyl-CoA is a really important molecule. So we've talked about how pyruvate is converted into acetyl-CoA. We just talked about how alcohol can be converted into acetyl-CoA. So what the heck did your body do with all this acetyl-CoA? Well, there are lots of different things your body can do with it. First of all, we've already talked about how acetyl-CoA can enter the TCA cycle. That's what we typically think about with acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is also the starting point for fatty acid synthesis and for cholesterol synthesis and for ketone synthesis. Let's shift gears now and talk about malnutrition. There are two states of malnutrition you should be familiar with. The first one is kwashiorkor. So kwashiorkor is protein malnutrition. You may still be getting plenty of calories, but you're not getting enough protein. So with protein malnutrition, you start to get fatty liver disease. So one of the liver's primary jobs is making all sorts of protein. But if you have protein deficiency, there's no amino acid building blocks, so the liver can't make proteins. And it also can't make ApoB100. Now, ApoB100 is the apolipoprotein that's found on the lipoprotein particles that contain triglycerides and cholesterol. If you can't make ApoB100 to put on those particles, those particles can't leave the hepatocyte. So those lipids just accumulate in the liver, and you get fatty liver disease. You're also going to have some edema with kwashiorkor because without adequate serum proteins, plasma is going to tend to leak out of the vasculature and get into the interstitium and cause edema. These patients can get anemia because they can't generate the proteins needed to make rapidly dividing cells like blood cells. Uh, these patients get skin lesions and they also get depigmentation of the skin and of the hair. So the skin is constantly sloughing off dead keratinocytes and, and generating new ones. So you need a lot of protein to maintain this constant regeneration. So without adequate protein, you're going to be prone to getting skin lesions. So one mnemonic for the main features of kwashiorkor is the word flame. The FL is for fatty liver, the A is for anemia, the M is for malnutrition, and the E is for edema. Now this is a picture from the CDC. And you see this classic image of a malnourished, skinny child with muscle wasting, and they have a large protuberant belly from the edema and ascites and hepatomegaly. This child also has thinning hair and some depigmentation of the hair and edema in his feet. Then the other malnutritional state is marasmus. Marasmus is a total energy malnutrition. So kwashiorkor is a protein malnutrition, but marasmus is a total energy malnutrition. It's not just protein that's missing. It's protein, it's fat, carbohydrates. Everything is deficient in the, in the diet of a patient with marasmus. So marasmus results in muscle wasting, subcutaneous fat loss, and edema. Now, what if you have a patient with marasmus that suddenly starts eating again? Maybe a patient that's been on a 10-day fast and starts to eat again, or he was stranded on a desert island like Castaway or Gilligan's Island or something for an entire week, and then he's rescued and he can start eating again. What might happen in this scenario is something called refeeding syndrome. Refeeding syndrome can take place in a person who's had negligible nutrient intake for at least five days. So during a fasting state, your body has to maintain osmotic balance in the blood. This means that the cells have to unload things like potassium and phosphates into the blood. They're sacrificing their, their, their uh, electrolytes and things into the blood. And basically that results in the cells becoming intracellularly depleted. And then what do we say was the primary energy substrate during a prolonged fast or a period of prolonged starvation? It's the conversion of fat to ketones. There's a little bit of gluconeogenesis going on, but your body's trying to conserve that protein and muscle tissue as best as it can. So it's going to sacrifice the fat tissue before it sacrifices the protein tissue as much as possible. Then when the patient is suddenly able to eat, and all of a sudden there's glucose and fats and protein available, all the cells start to say, hooray, we've got nutrients. And the body starts taking up all these nutrients from the blood and taking up potassium and magnesium and phosphate, all those things that they've been donating and they've become deficient in. Now they're able to scoop them all up. So in refeeding syndrome, as the cells start to pull nutrients from the blood, you get a drop in serum levels of magnesium and phosphate and potassium in particular. And that drop of magnesium and phosphate and potassium can cause arrhythmias and it can cause neurological problems. So when you feed someone after a, a prolonged fast, you need to kind of start low and go slow and monitor their electrolytes very, very closely. 
The other thing is that during this process of refeeding, there's going to be an overall depletion of ATP as cells phosphorylate things in order to trap them inside the cells. So as all those cells start to bring in glucose, they're going to phosphorylate the glucose, and that uses up ATP. So the cells may end up with an overall depletion of ATP, and that's a problem. All right, let's go ahead and complete the end of session quiz, and then we'll go over the answers. Let's go through these. First question, what is the primary energy source in a patient that has not eaten in two days? It's fatty acids. Next, what's the rate limiting enzyme in ketone body synthesis? It's HMG-CoA synthase. Next, a stressed physician comes home from work, consumes seven or eight shots of tequila in rapid succession before dinner, and then becomes hypoglycemic. So the question is, why does she become hypoglycemic? So remember this mechanism. You generate a lot of NADH when you metabolize ethanol. And that NADH shunts pyruvate toward the production of lactate, and it shunts oxaloacetate toward the production of malate. And this means that pyruvate and oxaloacetate are no longer available for gluconeogenesis. So the patient's more likely to become hypoglycemic. And then the last question, what are some of the hallmark features of quashiorcor? So remember our mnemonic flame for fatty liver, anemia, malnutrition, specifically protein malnutrition, and edema. And you also see skin lesions and skin and hair depigmentation. All right, that's it for Biochem 12. Welcome back to Celebrity Jeopardy. Keanu Reeves, you control the board. I'll take biochemistry for 100. It's the process of generating glucose for energy during periods of fasting or starvation. What is gluconeogenesis? That is correct. Most excellent. I know it's hard to believe, Alex, but I've never missed a meal. You don't say. Keanu, you still control the board. How about endocrinology for 100? It's the ketone body that causes the breath of DKA patients to smell sweet or fruity. What is acetoacetate? No. What is acetone? That's correct. Truly amazing. Is there a lunar eclipse tonight? I'll take biochemistry for 200. That's biochemistry. The answer. It's the ketone body used for energy in the CNS for energy during periods of prolonged starvation. What is beta hydroxy butyrate? Are you kidding me? Beta hydroxy butyrate is correct. <laughs> My publicist says I should start charging a butyrate when I'm on TV. How about biochemistry for 300? It's the only source of energy that red blood cells can metabolize. Six-week-old wedding cake? Not the answer we're looking for. What is glucose, Yessie? Correct. Uh, biochemistry for 400. Its metabolism yields nine kilocalories of energy per gram, more than either protein or carbohydrates. What is chocolate cake for breakfast? <laughs> no. But eggs and milk are in chocolate cake. Oh, goody! What is fat? That is correct. Hey, hey, hey! Knock it off, Bill. 